Well, you picked a, uh, a good week to be here because we are closing out this series that we've been in called Silent Night. Um, if you missed any of it, you, of course, can jump on the YouTube channel and, and catch up or, or watch along, or you can download the Timberlake app, and, and it's, all, it's all on there. All things Castle Rock are on there. So um, by all means, catch up. It's been a good couple weeks. I'm excited to close it out. I'm excited to get to January where we can kind of change gears and look in a new direction. But let me ask you this, okay? Maybe have a little fun. Do you remember... Uh, any monumental gifts from childhood, Christmas gifts? Like, do you remember opening up those, like, the, the, the favorite gift? You know what I'm talking about? Like, like, I have vivid, vivid memories of opening up a box on Christmas, Christmas morning, and, and, and sitting in this box is these big, beautiful, bright green turtle print Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle roller skates. <laughs> I still have them, and I still wear them. Um, <laughs> do you remember those? Like, I remember vivid memories of opening up my first Nintendo. Okay, not the Nintendo that we have now. You couldn't watch your Netflix on it. You couldn't talk to your friends with a crazy microphone on it. Uh, we didn't have those crazy chairs that rock, and they sit on the floor. You know what I'm talking about? I've got this dream in my head of being this incredible gamer. I'm not him. I love old Nintendos, the kind where you had to blow on the cartridge real hard to get the game. You know what I'm talking about? Does anybody have that memory? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, this is what I want you to do. I want you to pull up a monumental gift from childhood, one of your favorite gifts, okay, and I want you to turn to the person next to you and tell them what it is. Will you do that? You don't have anything, Bob? <laughs> Anybody have anything like remarkably good, like noteworthy, like you should tell the pastor on stage? Because it's just that good? Yes, just that good. What is it? It was an electric train set, but the train actually smoked. Whew. Come on, that's a good one. I got a new bed, Ryan. A what? A new bed. A new bed. That's a good one. Matt got his first bed this year. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Anything good? Anything like weird? Did we get anything really weird growing up? Anything that can beat maybe Ninja Turtle roller skates? <laughs> Man, I remember going to the, the skating rink, sliding my feet into those beautiful skates with <laughs> Michelangelo on the side of them. I read this statistic this past week that said two out of five men will buy Christmas presents for their spouse that are actually intended for them. Amen. Two out of five. Like, that's a really good, that's almost half of men. Anybody ever done that? I've done it one time in my entire life. It was this year. It was Shana's birthday. And it was a grilled cheese press. <laughs> like... Like, of all the things that I was going to buy for myself and secretly give to Shana, I went with a grilled cheese press. And here's the thing. I've gotten every penny's worth of that grilled cheese maker. <laughs> I'm confident, Shana, have you used it once? Shana's never used it. It's like old and rusty because of how many times I've used this thing. It's wonderful. Two out of five men. The cornerstone of, of this holiday, of course, is gifts, right? We, we offer monumental gifts, our favorite things growing up. We have our things that we get this year and, and things that we give. Gifts is, is kind of the, the cornerstone of Christmas. You know, yes, there's, there's food. Yes, family comes into town. We go out of town, but none of it really matters, right? It's all about the presents. It's all about the gifts. I would be remiss if I, if I didn't turn this into a church type direction and say that, of course, the cornerstone of this holiday is the gift, right? The gift that God gave us. Of course, our key verse through, this, through the last few weeks of this series has come from Luke chapter 2, where it says, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The result of the good news is the great joy, right? What better gift could we ever ask for? And yet this statement, when it's given, it almost brings this, this crisis of faith with it. It almost brings this disappointment with, with the people that, that the angel is speaking to, that I bring good news that will in turn bring great joy. 
See, the birth of Jesus came um, 400 years uh, after the last time they heard from God. 400 years since God has been in this, this uh, silent, almost disengaged period of time. Theologians call it an intertestamental period, that, that there were 400 years between uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament where no one heard from God. And all of a sudden, God shows up, an angel shows up and said, I, I come to bring good news. And he's speaking to these people that have not heard from God in 400 years. The last time people heard from him was a very, very long time ago. Prior to the silence, there were all of these prophecies that, that happened referring to this Messiah that was going to come, referring to this, this Savior that would be born, born to a virgin, a baby. The Old Testament closes out with uh, Micah where he says, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, are only a small village among all the people of Judah, yet a ruler of Israel will come from you, one whose origins are from a distant past. This is a prophecy being spoken to this group of people that was going through great suffering. They, they, they had bad rulers. They, they, they were under this, this horrible foreign oppression. And all of a sudden, somebody shows up and he says, hey, good news. Good news. A Messiah is going to be born. A king is coming from, from this tribe of Judah and it's going to be good. And, and to, this, to this group of people who, who's under this foreign oppression and struggling in life greatly, I can't imagine that the, the, the first thought is, yes, yes, it's coming. Like, like finally, God is going to be here. Finally, we don't have to sit through this oppression. Isaiah says it like this. He says, the Lord himself will give you the sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She'll give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Prophecy after prophecy pointing out of this horrible oppression into a Messiah coming. What incredible encouragement to this group of people. Because remember, there's this, there's this period of time where they're struggling and, and all of a the sudden there's this, this prophecy, it's this glimmer of hope in a very, very dark time. This, this bright spot in a very dark time where, where, where these men, these prophets are standing up and they're saying a virgin will come and she'll give birth to a son and his name will be God with us. God with us, the people in oppression, the people that are struggling. For people that believed in God and, and trusted God and, and put their faith in God, they're going through this hard time, but a ruler is coming. And that ruler's name literally means that God is going to come sit in our oppression. He's going to sit in our difficult time. He's going to sit in our struggle. He's God with us. I can't imagine it's not this massive nationwide sigh of relief. And yet the people's excitement began to fade because you had this, this prophecy and then you had dead air. I mean, it's like somebody telling you, man, tomorrow you're going to get the greatest gift of all time. And then you never hear from that person again because you died. <laughs> because nobody lives 400 years. And it's interesting when we compare their period of time with, with our period of time and the things that we go through. And obviously the situations are different and, and the things and the struggles that we walk through are different. But but when you compare it to our faith, I think that some of the challenges are very, very similar. If you have your notes, you can pull them out. There's some fill-in-the-blanks on there that, that maybe you can write them in and maybe you didn't get notes. I apologize for that. You can blame me or somebody else, preferably someone else. Um, <laughs> of course, we're on the screen. But we find very similar challenges like this. Your first one is delays. We find delays. When it comes to our faith, we find delays. The people of Israel had begun to lose their faith. They had 400 years to walk through where they didn't hear from God. And when it comes to our faith, we face delays. We see delays. I think that when Jesus did show up, it's probably a big reason why people had a hard time understanding him. Why they had a hard time grabbing on to this Jesus thing. Because they kind of lost their faith. And some people still held on to it, but a lot of people lost it. God had, had devolved into to, to rules and, and rituals, and there was very little hope that God was actually with us, that God would be with us, or that he would be with us in a real way. I mean, think about, 
how many generations were born and died within this period of 400 years. They heard about this God thing, but never saw him. They never saw him. They never experienced him. They, they never heard from him. They, they maybe heard of him. I, I can't imagine that the silence was not deafening for this group of people. But the reality is that it was a very major part in God's eternal plan. That silence was a part of God's plan. He was gone, but he was not delayed. Or he was not gone, he was delayed. Does that make sense? He was not gone, he was not missing, he was simply delayed. Chosen delay. The problem is, is in our delay, because remember, we face the same things that these people face. In our delay, we feel like God is gone. Not that he's delayed, but, but he has removed himself from the situation. In our inability to be content with God's timing, forces us to hurry things. When God is saying, slow down. Delay can lead to the next thing, or disappointment. Delays lead to disappointments. God delivers this message, and, and he closes out this, uh, this, this Old Testament in Malachi, and, and then he hits this gigantic pause on communication with mankind. Things had started to progress, and all of a sudden, the progression came to this, this halt. Remember, they're under this oppression. They're under this heavy time, and, and they're starting to feel like they're coming out of it, and God's gone. He's gone. Some people demanded God act like he always acted. Some people assumed that mankind had become too sinful, and, and so God took his hand off of mankind. I mean, could you imagine a man sinning so much that God just says, I'm done with this? I feel like if it hasn't happened in 2018, it's probably not going to happen, right? Like if God's not washed us clean yet or washed, washed his hands clean of us, it probably won't happen. But the disappointment that had to have come on this group of people. So frequently in life, it's not the delay that's our downfall. It's our disappointment in the fact that life maybe not has, has not gone in the way that we would have expected it to go or, or chosen it to go. That disappointment is our downfall. Maybe you've been hurt. Maybe your marriage has fallen apart. Maybe your business has collapsed. Whatever those, those struggles are, they, they butt up against our faith. And, and when we're not focused on the good news, when we're not focused on, on this joy that's coming, our, our disappointment begins to win a battle that, that the disappointment was never intended to win. The next one's kind of hard to swallow, but... We struggle in our faith when we find our disobedience, when disobedience comes into play. You want a quick way to shut your faith down? Step outside of the will of God. Step outside from where God would have you be. This one's a hard one. It's a hard one to talk about on Christmas. Right? It's not the most uplifting thing in the world, but, but I don't think that we talk about it enough. Outside of the will of God, being outside of where God wants us to be. Do you realize the more we say yes, the more our faith grows? And the counter to that is the more we say no, the quicker our faith begins to fade and diminish and, and it becomes rather shallow. What's so hard for us to grasp is that a lot of times we say no without saying no. Does that make sense? Are you with me? We say no without saying no. We say no in our inaction. We say no in our, our, our um, lack of diving into the word to figure out how God wants us to live or or. or, or set our life up to be lived the way that God would have us live, to act the way that he's designed us to act, to, to talk the way that he's designed us to talk. The people of Israel walked away from God. The scary part is God's like, man, there's a very natural consequence for walking away. The cool thing is that he's like, you can always come back. God's like, you don't have to follow me. That's fine. You don't have to follow. I'm not going to force myself on you. You don't have to follow but just so you know, I'll be here when you get back. I'll be here. I'll be here when you change your mind. And then finally, the last thing that, that challenges our faith is our doubt. Doubt's interesting because it can be best friends with faith. Doubt and faith can, can go hand in hand. The problem is that sometimes we doubt and, and we don't seek answers. And when we don't seek answers, that's when we start to get into trouble and, and that faith begins to, to diminish. So let's change gears. We don't want all this gloom and doom, right? Let's, let's change gears and go the other direction. You still with me? Do we need to talk about our Christmas presents again? Yeah. Are we getting anything good this year? Just me? I've opened like four Christmas presents already. Over the last month. It's not even like yesterday. 
Shana is such a freak about holding on to presents. She cannot do it. I literally could have opened all of my presents by now, but I hold her off. Let's change gears. We're supposed to talk about good news on Christmas. My goal this morning is that we would walk out of here with a better faith, a bigger faith, faith that matters. Scripture says that our faith can move mountains, right? Hebrews 11 says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for, and it's assurance of what we do not see. Faith is confidence in the things that we want, and it's assurance in things that we don't understand. Let's take a look at how we move forward in our faith. Here's your first thing. We move from optimism to certainty. We move from optimism to certainty. Having assurance that that God is who he says he is and that he did what he said he did. The gift that was given in Luke chapter 2 that that was laid out for centuries before Jesus ever walked on the earth. Before this this great exchange happened for, for, for life, for death. Oftentimes in church, we see these two words interchangeable, this, this optimism and certainty. But determined faith is more than hopeful optimism, it's certainty. Determined faith is more than optimism, it's knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt, certainty. There are very few things in life that we are certain of, very few things. This is one of the things that I want to be certain of. I want, to, I want to have assurance in, in the fact that I know what I know. See, oftentimes we lose faith, and, and when we do, we turn to self-help. But I truly believe that, that if self-help worked, I would have had it together a long time ago. Right? Like self, self can grow, self can change, but self cannot cure. Right? If that was truly God's intention, then... Literally all we would be celebrating on Tuesday was, was presence. Well, that's not God's intention. Sometimes as a, as a follower of Christ, um, as a pastor, as a father, my kids will say things that will just make me melt inside. Right? Like my kids sometimes say really annoying things, and, so, and sometimes my kids say really, really great things. So, so last week, um, one of my kids comes home, and, and she was telling us about this conversation that she had with the teacher at her school. And... Uh, and she tells us that, that she told her teacher that, that the real meaning of Christmas was Jesus. And I thought, yes, right? Like, we don't pound that into our kids. We just live the life, and we want our kids to see us live the life, so we live that life. And, and, and when your kid confirms that, that you're living the right way, it just makes you melt inside, right? So our kid comes home. I told my teacher that the meaning of Christmas was Jesus. And I thought, good kid, right? And then she said, uh, my teacher disagreed with me. And she said, the real meaning of Christmas is family. And I thought, well, that's bad, right? <laughs> and then you have this like moment of, oh, shoot, what do you do here? <laughs> and so we're talking, talking through it. And of course, she disagreed with the teacher politely, I'm assuming. She's a very polite kid, probably not as sassy as I would have preferred her. <laughs> like, like, I want my kid to be like, no, ma'am, you listen. She was probably very polite, and, and she, come home, and she comes home, and she's telling us this story, and, and she's kind of confused, and she's not confused what the meaning of Christmas is. There was no confusion lying in, in what she said to the teacher. She was confused by the fact that the teacher didn't have the level of certainty that she had. It was weird and amazing, and so we talked her through it, and I said, you go back to that teacher tomorrow. <laughs> I didn't say that. I said, it is what it is, right? But we teach our kids. Thousands of years ago, God decided to do for me what I could not do for myself. And I'm certain of that. See, I think that we have spiritual conclusions, and they're very, very important. And I think for us to understand the level of necessity it takes to be certain is very important that we have to strive to get to this level of certainty, not optimism. I don't want wishful thinking. I don't want to hope. I want to be assured. I want to be certain. I want to know beyond a shadow of a doubt. And not that doubt never comes into play. I I don't know anybody who who has completely devolved doubt from their life. But I want to know that the most logical 
thing that I can do is trust God. And maybe for you, it's it's trust God. Maybe it's trust God again. Maybe it's getting back to that place with God. Because our faith is not in our faith. Our faith is in our faithfulness. Look at the progression that Mary had. It says this in Luke chapter 1. It says, but the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. And you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? Man, you think you lack faith in the virgin birth? What about Mary? You know, like God's like, hey, just so you know, you're pregnant. And Mary looks back at God and was like, God, you missed a very important step in this process. And you got to tell Joseph. Like. And yet, she saw God work in ways that maybe she didn't understand, but she grabbed onto. It says in Luke 2, 19, it says, But Mary kept all these things in her heart and, threw out, and thought about them often. Buried deep inside of Mary was this certainty in her faith that God is who he says he is, and that he's going to do what he says he's going to do. Here's your second thing. We move from knowledge to narrative. Faith is not just this cerebral understanding. It's not our ability to explain the nature of God. It's knowing how God enters our experiences. For Mary, in verse 7, it says she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. That was Mary's experience, something that built Mary's faith. Mary had a story. So when I ask you about your faith, I'm asking, what is your story? How does faith play a part in your story? What's your story of faith? What's your story of faith from when your kid was diagnosed with cancer? What's your your story of faith from from when your marriage survived infidelity? What's your story of faith when when you were generous beyond your normal standard of, of generosity? What's your story? You look up faith in the dictionary and it's a noun. You look up faith in the Bible and it's a verb. There's an action to faith that is required. It's when we move it from our our, our heads to our hearts. It's it's when we move it from our heads to our hands. We move it from our, our, our heads to our feet. That's where faith comes into play. So often we think about God being this God that, that is uh, up in heaven sitting on this throne and and he walks on streets of gold completely void of any understanding of what we, what we live through in the real world. He's God in heaven. He's God. He can do anything he wants. But, but down here we struggle, right? I think that we forget about the fact that Jesus is God and Jesus gets it because Jesus entered our story. He came down from heaven and he entered our story. It's called the incarnation where God put aside godliness and clothed himself in skin and bones and walked like we walk. I think Jesus understood what it was like to be poor. I think that Jesus understood what it was like to have family problems. Jesus had parents. Jesus had brothers. I love to think about teenage Jesus. You know what I mean? Last week we talked about college. I've got all these ages lined up in my head. Teenage Jesus was a real thing. Like we see Jesus as a baby, and then we see Jesus as a 30-year-old man starting his ministry. Jesus was 14 at one point. Like I've got these images in my head of Jesus like slamming the door shut. Ah, you're not my real dad. You know, like, <laughs> like Jesus was a kid at some point. Like Jesus had the disappointment of not opening the right Christmas gift. and Like the, the interactions with his brothers. And I don't know what Jesus was like at 14, but, but I'm sure that Jesus understands our family issues, our struggles that we walk through with our family. You ever had a friend hurt you before? Jesus, or Judas betrayed him and, and Peter denied him. Jesus came and entered our story and lived a life like we live. And he understands what we're going through. He came to the world to say, I know what this is like. I know what you're walking through. And finally, here's number three. How do we move forward in our faith? We move from dark to light. Isaiah describes Jesus coming like this. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. 
the only value that the light has, the only value that the light has, the only value that, that we find in understanding that the way is illuminated is if we choose to follow God in that direction. Who cares if the path is lit if we don't go down it, right? Who cares if, it, if, if there's this illuminated route for us to get to where we're supposed to be if we don't take that path? God is a God that wants to take us from, 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 from darkness to light. He's a God that wants to take us from death to life. He's a God that wants to take us from, from sorrow to joy. He's a God that wants to take us from, from defeat to victory. This is the point where we decide which side of the equation we want to be on. Do we want to be on the defeat side or do we want to be on the victory side? I want to be on the victory side. I want to be on the side that God intended me to be on, that he set me up to be on. Hebrews chapter 12 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Man, what if your name was the perfecter of faith? For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For the joy set before him. And maybe you're running a race and it feels like the race is, is unending. Maybe you're running a race and it feels like you're, you're looking down the barrel of shame. You're looking down the, the barrel of defeat. There's no... There's no end in sight. There's no victory in sight. There's no positive element in sight. Maybe it seems like the path gets dim at one spot. And yet in Luke chapter 2, an angel comes. He says, I came to bring you good news that will bring great joy. Jesus endured the cross for that joy. For that joy. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. He took on the punishment so that we don't have to. He took on the punishment so that we can take on that joy. He went to the cross for that joy, to provide that joy, in light of that joy. Listen, those words were spoken before uh, Jesus came. 400 years before he came, Isaiah spoke up, before this child came. Isaiah said a child would be born, and it was prophetic, hundreds of years in advance. And then the child came, and the good news was brought, and the gift, the good gift brought this great joy. And the joy comes in the fact that we can move from darkness to light. 